It's been 10 days since the world watched in utter shock the crimes that were committed against Israeli civilians by Hamas terrorists across large parts of southern Israel bordering the Gaza Strip. Women, children, the elderly, no one was spared. Over a thousand Israeli citizens have died and now we're given to understand over 150 of them are still in captivity. In response, Israel has launched a massive operation primarily through airstrikes up until now, but it is also preparing for a massive ground invasion of Gaza. It has asked more than a million Gazans living in the northern part of that tiny strip to move south in what the UN says could lead to a humanitarian catastrophe. But beyond the shock and awe of the pictures that we saw 10 days ago and the immediate aftermath of the loss of so many innocent civilian lives, where is this story moving? What is the long-term solution, if at all there is one, between Israel and Palestine? Joining me now for a comprehensive understanding of this issue, not just the immediacy and the brutality of the pictures that has shocked and awed us, but also towards a more permanent solution to try and help us understand this. I'm now joined by a very special guest. You will know Harari is an Israeli author and historian. Thank you very much, Mr. Harari, for speaking with us here on CNN News 18. Uh, let, me Thank start, you for me. let me start with uh, asking you, you know, the events of October 7th. For you personally, I'm sure it's still etched in your memory. It's perhaps images you won't ever be able to forget in the rest of your lifetime. When you saw those pictures, what was running through your head? What was, what was going through your mind? Locations. It was not IDF personnel who were targeted or government officials who were targeted. It was the most helpless among citizens who were targeted. Why do you yeah. think that was the case? What was the, the thinking there? I think the thinking of Hamas is to wage a war to end all peace, to make sure that there is never peace in the region. Nothing frightens Hamas more than the possibility of peace. Israel, the background to this attack is that Israel has signed a couple of peace treaties with Gulf states in recent years, and we were just on the verge of signing a historic peace treaty with Saudi Arabia, which was supposed to normalize relations between Israel and most of the Arab world, also to improve the lives of millions of Palestinians held under Israeli occupation in the uh, occupied Palestinian territories, and possibly also restart the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. And this frightened Hamas, and this is why Hamas launched this terrible attack, and it did it in a way that was calculated to sow seeds of hatred, not for the few weeks or a few months, but for generations. Again, when you uh, torture and kill parents in front of their children, and make sure that this is publicized, you not only traumatize these children, you traumatize an entire nation. And the aim is to make sure that there is never a possibility of peace. And I think that Israel now is in a struggle, not just to protect its territory and citizens, but to protect its humanity. Uh, despite what Hamas did, Israel must keep the possibility of peace alive. So to that extent, the Israeli response now, there have been massive airstrikes across the last 10 days. Israel is preparing for a, a big ground invasion. Do you think uh, in that sense, Israel is sort of walking into the trap that Hamas has laid? Because Hamas, like you said, wanted exactly this. It wanted all these peace accords between Israel and its Arab neighbors to be completely blown out. Uh, there is no more possibility of the Saudi-Israel deal because Saudi Arabia has also taken its traditional position when it comes to the Palestine question. Uh, has Hamas achieved what it wanted to achieve through the course of this terrorist attack? And is Israel, the US, and perhaps some of its Arab partners also, by doing what they have done in the last 10 days, walked into that trap? How do you get out of that trap? Yeah, it's a very dangerous trap. Again, Israel needs to find a balance between its, its, its duty to protect its citizens 
and its territory. Again, on a very personal level, my, the, the, my surviving family members, they, they are now refugees. They just can't go back to their homes as long as a terrorist organization like Hamas is, uh, 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 exists and is armed a, a kilometer or two from their homes. On the other hand, uh, Israelis should not go down to the level of Hamas. Unlike this terrorist organization, we should remain committed to international law, to human rights, to the hope for peace. So how to find this balance is, is very difficult and we need help from our friends around the world. The United States has done some very, very important moves in recent days. On the one hand, giving full support for Israel, including even sending two aircraft carriers with hundreds of airplanes to Israel, and also at the same time, restraining Israel from widening the circle of violence and uh, uh, putting pressure on Israel to adhere to international laws and norms. And uh, I think that if Israel received similar support from our friends across the world, it will make it easier for us to do the right thing. Because again, what this attack really tried to do is to destroy our trust in humanity. When you witness such atrocities, this is really an assault on, on the mind, on the soul. It, it, it really destroys your trust in humanity, and then you, you, you lose your own humanity. And when outsiders, like the United States, like India, in this moment of crisis, I, I think their important role is to help us regain our trust in humanity and make sure that uh, we don't descend into the depth of depravity of an organization like Hamas. Okay. I also want to know your thoughts, and there is this argument that's been going on uh, for the last few days. Uh, there is a sort of moral equivalence that's being tried to be drawn. Uh, you know, Hamas mm. killing innocent Israeli civilians, and then the supporters of Hamas or the supporters of the idea of a Palestinian state saying that, well, Israel's going to kill innocent Gazan civilians as well. What do you make of this trying to draw a moral equivalence kind of argument? I think we should be very careful about that. Again, we should have sympathy for uh, human suffering, or wherever it is. Um, but you know, Israel is not deliberately targeting civilians for the sake of killing civilians. A lot of civilians, millions of civilians in the Gaza Strip are now under enormous pain and fear. But Israel's aim is not to slaughter as many civilians as it can, in contrast to Hamas. Um, our aim, again, should be eventually to come out of this with a possibility of peace. Uh, Hamas was never willing. This is the thing, again, that frightens it most, more, more than anything else, the, the, the possibility of, of peace. So there is no moral equivalent there either. Again, I've, I've been in recent years a very fierce critic yeah. of the Israeli government and of Israeli policies uh, with regard to the Palestinians. I think Israel has made terrible mistakes uh, in the way it abandoned many attempts to, to make peace with the Palestinians um, in its policies in the occupied territories. But this is no justification for what Hamas has done. And again, it should be very clear Hamas didn't uh, uh, annihilate my uncle's community and murdered and tortured civilians in the hope of restarting the peace process. It really hoped to sow seeds of, of further violence and hate with this. And you see it also now with the hostages crisis. Hamas is holding hostage um, two-year-old babies and eight-year-old grandmothers. Yeah. And I hear people say, well, you have to negotiate with Hamas and give, give Hamas something so they, Hamas will release them. Why do you need to give anyone anything to release a two-year-old baby? This is unheard of. 
you know, and, and many, and one more point, many of these communities on the border with the Gaza Strip, people, they are not the settlements in the occupied territories. Mm -hmm. They are actually the, some of the last remaining bastions of the Israeli left and of the peace movement in Israel. I'll give you one, again, human story from, from my uncle's community. A, a 74 year old woman called Vivian Silver, for years she lived under rocket attacks from Gaza, but she remained a very important peace activist. She, uh, uh, one of her missions was to drive sick people from the Gaza Strip to hospitals in Israel. And this she did for years despite repeated attacks by Hamas. Now, she's 74 years old. She was kidnapped. We don't know where she is. We hope she's not dead. Hopefully she is now held hostage by Hamas. Mm -hmm. I mean, why hold a 74-year-old peace activist hostage? Who, who, who does such a thing? I, I also want to know, uh, and one of the pertinent points that you made is the intent of Hamas in the October 7th uh, uh, barbarism was to target civilians, whereas the Israeli Defense Forces in whatever operation they've undertaken uh, over the last week or 10 days or what, they're, what they intend to undertake now, the intention is not to kill civilians. Civilians could be collateral yeah. damage, but I think that's an important, yeah, uh, I, important distinction I, to make. I cannot... You know, I, I'm not familiar with every step Israel takes. I cannot defend necessarily every step Israel takes. Sure. I have my own suspicion of, 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 of the government. But it's very clear that Israel doesn't try to kill as many civilians as possible like Hamas has done. And that the problem that Israel faces is that Hamas is using Palestinian civilians as human shields Hamas has placed its military installations, its weapon systems inside population centers, civilian population centers. Uh, there are reports that Hamas is trying to prevent civilians from leaving the, the battle areas in order to uh, have this kind of, of protection yeah. from Israeli attacks. This is not what happened on the massacre on, on the 7th of October. Uh, the communities that were targeted were totally civilian. There was no military installations or weapon systems inside these communities. I also want to ask you about your thoughts uh, on the response from the government of India and the Prime Minister. One of the first, I believe, within the first few hours of the attack last Saturday to come out and publicly condemn the attacks, call it terrorism and say that we are on the side of the victims uh, of, of uh, the Hamas terrorism that was unleashed last Saturday in your country. Uh, is it time for everyone, when it comes to the question of terrorism, where civilians are attacked and the intent is to attack civilians, uh, that should be called out. The world should not, the civilized world should not have any place where civilians are attacked. Uh, absolutely. Again, a distinction needs to be made between Hamas and the Palestinian people. They are not the same thing. Uh, people should, at the, at, at the moment, uh, voice their concerns for the safety and rights of the Palestinian civilians, uh, but they should condemn in every possible way and sanction in every possible way uh, the terrorists of, of Hamas. And I also hope that I know that India is, uh, is, is had good relations with Iran and with several of the other countries involved in, in the crisis now. And I hope that India uses whatever influence it has to help de-escalate the conflict and also put pressure that, you know, to, to provide the, the first tiny ray of light that Hamas immediately releases without conditions all the hostages it, it, it took. So you, uh, it, it's an you, you believe that that would be the, the, the immediate starting point uh, to try and talk about any kind of pullback or to try and yes. talk about any kind of de-escalation. The starting point for that has to be the release of civilians who've been taken hostage. Again, talking you know, almost on a psychological level, the, the, um, if all the hostages are immediately released, this will give a small breathing space 
for the Israeli public, for the Israeli government to, to feel that the, the, there is hope, there is some hope in the situation. And this could be the basis for much, uh, for de-escalation that will also protect millions of innocent Palestinian civilians from terrible suffering. All right, one final word. You know, Israel is going in, most likely the ground operation uh, will start this week. Uh, the idea, the military objective is to ensure that Hamas is dead and that Hamas does not have the ability to launch the kinds of attacks that we saw last Saturday on Israeli citizens. But what happens after that? Yeah. What comes after Hamas? Is there going to be a vacuum? What takes the place of that vacuum? There can't be a vacuum. The va vacuum invites the worst chaos. Uh, there should be hope. I mean, there should be hope, not just for families like my uncle's family, that they can go back living on uh, uh, next to the Gaza Strip. There must be hope for the Palestinians inside Gaza. Um, again, at, at this moment, it's almost impossible to imagine it. But uh, um, I hope that whether it's the Palestinian Authority, whether it's the United States, whether it's Saudi Arabia, India, Turkey, whoever is willing to take upon themselves the extremely difficult task of simultaneously rebuilding Gaza and giving hope to the Palestinians there and making sure that Hamas remains disarmed, that the Gaza becomes demilitarized and doesn't continue to serve as a basis for terrible terrorist attacks on their neighbors.